Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to this meeting of the London Borough of Newham Health and Adult Social Care Scrutiny Commission. Can everyone present on the Zoom hear me? Yes. This evening's meeting is being held at East Ham Town Hall. As you can see, members unable to join us physically at this location are able to join remotely. However, they will not be able to vote and their attendance won't be officially recorded, though their virtual attendance will be noted in the minutes. I'd like to welcome members of the public and press who are physically attending or watching on YouTube. With regards to the meeting etiquette, members of the council, please can I ask that you indicate that you wish to speak by raising your physical hand or by using the hand up symbol on the Zoom dashboard. For this meeting, we have Roger Raymond present to advise on protocols and to assist councillors and officers with technology. This meeting of the London Borough of Newham Health and Social Care Scrutiny is now called to order. So I'd like to start with introductions. Um, if I turn to committee members, uh, Councillor Laguda. Councillor Joy Laguda. Jennifer Lahistra. Councillor Noor Begum. Councillor John Gray, West Ham member of this scrutiny committee commission. And on the Zoom, we have uh, Councillor Verdi. Yeah, Councillor Avendis Verdi, Bolin Ward, apologies for not attending in person. Fantastic. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? Uh, Danny Councillor Welsh and Ada from Public Health has also given apologies for the Secondly, response to the health and equalities report. Item. And do we have any declarations of interest from any members of uh, the committee? Um, I, I need to make a declaration of interest at this point. Um, we're going to be looking at primary care this evening, and my current day job is involved in uh, delivering a project around uh, delivering a, a resident engagement uh, infrastructure. Uh, within uh, Hackney and City's primary care system. So I'm just going to declare that interest now. Um, moving on to uh, the agenda, the next item I have is item four, which is the minutes. Uh, the minutes of the meeting, our last meeting, which was held on the 10th of November 2022. These can be found in the supplementary agenda. Can I move as a correct record uh, the minutes of this meeting? And do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Falola. Um, so are the minutes agreed? Agreed. Fantastic. Uh, so moving on to item five, work programme. Um, we have the work programme within our agenda papers. Our next meeting will be on March the 12th, when we're going to be looking at our standing item, update on practical matters. So we'll be returning to our integrated care system and the functioning of our place-based system, um, as well as the strategic implications for Newham. We'll also be looking at the dentistry framework and uh, disability uh, within our health inequalities work. Um, are there any items anyone from the committee would like to add to this agenda? March. Fantastic. So moving on to the substantive items for this evening. First item is our standing item, an update on uh, pressing matters. This item is here to allow the commission to hear about pressing matters in the borough, such as COVID, uh, waiting lists for surgery and outpatients appointments in, in the NHS, and other pressures in the local health system alongside updates from uh, concerning other related issues. I'm delighted to welcome to this meeting Councillor Neil Wilson, Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care, who's joining us in person. Uh, Jason Strelitz, Interim Corporate Director for Adults and Health. Councillor Mumtaz Khan, Deputy Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care. Um, do we have Jonathan Cox as Public Health Consultant? I think Jonathan will be joining for the health inequalities item. Okay. Yeah, hello, I'm, I'm here. Hi, <laughs> Hi Jonathan. Um, Charlotte Taylor, Director of Improvement, Change and, Tra and Control, Adults and Health. Yep. Good um, evening. 
Claire Grushuk, apologies if I've mispronounced your name, public health consultant. She's, I think, saying so, no apologies. Okay. Claire Soley, Director of Quali Quality Assurance, Safeguarding and Workforce Development. Simon Reid, Director of Commissioning Adults and Health. Sending a point. I think, yeah. Yeah, Joe Fraser Wise, Interim Joint Newham Director of Delivery, uh, NHS North East London. Hi. Marie Truman Abel, Interim Joint Newham Director of Delivery, NHS North East London. Thanks, Chair. Uh, and then finally, uh, Simon Ashton, Chief Executive of Newham University Hospital. I'm very pleased you're able to join us for this item. Uh, are there any other executive members, officers, or anyone else uh, who'd like? Ah, oh, Tony Jobling. Thank you, President. <laughs> um, so I'd like to invite Councillor Neil Wilson and Jason Strelitz to make some brief opening remarks. Thanks very much, Chair. So I'm Councillor Neil Wilson, Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care. Yeah, I welcome uh, your, your guidance here, Chair, that we're having this standing item updates and the commission in fact because uh, the health landscape is obviously a changing one but this is where we're really focusing on what's been exercising our residents minds particularly over what they see in media and what's reported in local press or or nowadays on um, twitter feeds and uh, whatsapp about elective waiting lists so we turn over to um, our colleagues from barts on that and also uh, we might consider uh, the impact of industrial action. Another thing that elected members do get quite a, a series of questions, as you, you, you probably are well aware as the chair of the relevant scrutiny. And it is about how we, particularly as a majority group that has uh, roots within the trade movement, union movement, we can say this officer can't. So I'm just saying this now, uh, that we can actually identify with the needs of a really stretched workforce and with their current industrial disputes. So hopefully that's just as much political as I want to be, handing over to Jason at this point. Um, I think all I'd, I'd say by way of update is we all know that the system has been under significant pressure through the winters, um, through the winter, sorry, um, with um, you know historic winter pressures that we're all very used to, augmented by a lot of challenges, a lot of challenges of workforce, challenges of infection. So, um, so you know, much much less impactful, but still impactful. COVID, significant flu, um, some childhood some childhood infections as well that put the system under significant pressure. I think from an epidemiological point of view, that situation has got significantly better in recent weeks, which is good news. Um, um, but the system remains under under pressure that I'm sure our, our NHS and uh, Tony will Tony can speak to you from a social care point of view. Thank you. So I'd now like to turn to um, the officers we have in the room: Simon Ashton, Joe Fraser Wise, Marie Truman Abel, and uh, Tony Jobling. Uh, I'm wondering whether you, you'd like to um, add some comments to that or whether you'd rather go straight to questions. Uh, just a couple of comments, Chair. Um, just really to endorse what Jason has described around winter pressures and the impact on the hospital. Um, so certainly through December and into the first couple of weeks of January, the hospital was under severe pressure from some very sick patients attending our emergency department. Um, and as Jason's described, we we probably peaked in late December with flu and COVID cases and strep A, and certainly the anxiety around strep A through December um, caused an increase in attendances. Um, since uh, probably mid-January, the uh, acuity of patients, so the sickness of patients has decreased significantly, as has the presentation of COVID. And flu so the, the pressure has lessened through the course of the last two to three weeks um, I'd also just uh, flag you've probably seen the report that we're we're still continuing to make good progress in clearing or treating our patients that have waited a significantly long period of time as a consequence of the COVID pandemic 
Um, the next milestone is to uh, treat everybody who's been worked in 78 weeks or longer by the 1st of April and as a hospital we're on track to achieve that. Um, we're, we're coping with industrial action quite well. The physiotherapists were on strike today. Uh, they're back tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, the London Ambulance Service are on strike. Um, to date, uh, the strikes haven't had a significant impact on our ability to continue to provide elective or emergency care, um, but they have taken a huge amount of planning and preparation for me to be able to say that. So a, a huge credit to all the team at the hospital. Um, and I'm happy to take questions about any 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 items in the paper or anything I've just said. Tony Jobling, before I go to the committee, as, the, as Director of Operations uh, for the Council's Adult Social Care Team, would you like to add anything in, in, in terms of uh, your team's experiences at the moment? Uh, yeah, fine. Yes, the teams are managing. Um, when there are pressure points such as the strikes, we have plans in place ready to step in if need be. But as Simon's explained, things seem to be working OK. The area for us in social care really is around the provider market um, and the difficulty in finding places for people quickly if they need, to go, need to go into residential and nursing care. But as a department, we have addressed that. Uh, we've blocked for booked beds in a number, well, in two care homes, um, ready um, to get people out as quickly as possible. But it's the provider market that's the issue for us. Um, but in terms of hospital discharge, nothing further to report. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to go to questions from the committee and I'm gonna sort of jump in at this point. I'm, I'm relieved to hear that you think we're past our peak. Um, I know that the last few meetings you've been talking about Newham Hospital being virtually at capacity, you, you know, in terms of 99, 98% occupancy. And I think, I think, you know, the aims generally for closer to 85%, just to um, give an idea of um, the pressures you've been operating under. Um, what level of capacity are we at now, just to get an idea of how things might have improved? Yes, yeah, it's, it's still, it's still very high. Um... We're probably at 98, 99% bed occupancy. Um, and we have got winter pressure beds up and we've, we opened some more uh, beds as we described the last time we were here, I think in terms of our planning to manage the, the, the volume of people attending. Um, uh, what, what I would just draw your attention to is that the uh, NHS planning guidance for the coming year for hospitals is to um, increase their bed base and reduce bed occupancy to 92 percent um now, now clearly that's going to be a challenge to nhs hospitals uh, nationally but i think it's re a really positive move that the department of health have, have made that a standard for the coming year and what they're endorsing is that we retain our winter capacity escalation beds and that they become funded beds um, I think there'll be a challenge about how that funding actually arrives in the hospital, but but they're making a statement that we should keep the beds open and keep them funded, which is probably the first time in a long time that we, we've heard that from the Department of Health. So I think that's quite a positive uh, uh, position to take into the new financial year. And in the papers um, that you submitted ahead of the meeting, uh, you talk about your remote emergency coordination hub uh, as a way of kind of trying to redirect traffic away from the hospital. And I'm just wondering how successful that's been and what proportion of cases you have been able to redirect uh, to be dealt with in other areas and whether you could sort of talk a bit about that work. Yeah, so that, that's been really successful. I haven't got the exact numbers to hand, but we could I could certainly send those on. We have that data about the number of patients that we've seen and and saved uh, attendances either in ED or um, admissions into the hospital. And, and essentially it's, a, it's an enhanced service that provides support to the ambulance service so that the attending paramedics, when they reach a patient, uh, can call what we call in the remote emergency access coordination hub, the REACH. And they have uh, senior doctors uh, available who can provide advice and support. And they also have a directory of service uh, to be able to refer patients into community services or provide support at home uh, to stop the patient from being automatically uh, brought into our emergency department and potentially admitted. So the emphasis is on keeping patients in their own home and supporting them with 
uh, services that are currently available in the community. Fantastic. Do I have any questions from anyone on the committee? Uh, Councillor Gray, I saw your hand first. Yeah, no, thank you, Chair. No, um, perhaps I should know, I don't, but I understand some trusts in London are reballoting. So, um, does that include um, yours, Simon, or ours? <laughs> Yeah, so the, the, the reballoting or balloting is, is run by the unions. So it's not actually, if, you, if you're talking about industrial action and different professional groups, it's not actually the trust which is... Which no, no, is, no, I'm not suggesting that. I'm saying, are they reballoting? Are the unions reballoting in your trust? Oh, which, which unions? Unison is reballoting, I think, in um, certain uh, trusts in London. Uh, they okay. didn't reach the fifty percent threshold, but they're rebalancing uh, now. So, is that happening in your trust area? So, I'm not um, in terms of. In ter I can only speak by professional groups. So, uh, in in terms of the nursing staff, which didn't reach the threshold to strike, or the midwifery staff who didn't reach the threshold to strike, my understanding is that there's no current plan to rebalance those those two professional groups. Um, there are a number of other groups that have reached the threshold and are going to strike. The next big ballot is the junior doctor ballot uh, in February. Um, but I'm not aware of any reballoting of, of professional groups that have already been balloted and not reached the threshold. Definitely happening in at least one trust. I spoke to somebody yesterday who's uh, uh, rebalancing. OK, but I'll take that away. Um... Councillor Laguda. Yeah, this is to Simon. Sorry, I can't hear very well today. Maybe because I've got a cold, so I can't hear. My hearing is not very good. I'm just wondering, you know, I'm actually impressed with your reduction of uh, waiting lists. And I'm hoping that you are going to keep it up. Can you tell us the strategies you use to have this waiting list done so other people can learn from it? because you seem to have done very well on it. It's a positive question anyway. Yeah, yeah th thank, thank you very much. Um, that's really kind of you. Um, there's an awful lot of hard work that goes into uh, treating our patients in Newham as quickly as possible. Um, I think that the, the, the key is te teamwork and oversight of detail. So every patient's pathway has to be tracked in detail and every step of the pathway has to be monitored and moved on uh, when they've completed each step. Um, so it's, it's an awful lot of hard work of, of tracking every single patient through their pathway and making sure they get each step of their pathway as, as quickly as possible. Um, I'd probably say that the other, the other major contributing factor is that um, during the course of the pandemic, um, you'll probably all remember that we had different waves of pandemic and in between the major peaks of, of the waves of the pandemic, we restarted elective activity. So we kept trying to, trying to treat our elective patients. And during one of those restarts, we were able to open two additional theatres at Newham. Uh, so we increased the number of theatres, that we, the operating theatres that we have at Newham. So we went from four to six theatres. So having two extra theatres and the additional staffing that we've been able to recruit to those theatres available has also helped us has reduced the backlog of, of patients waiting as well. So it's a it's a it's a double impact, I think, of having more space, more more staff, and also uh, a, a, a lot of detailed work on each patient's pathway. But but thank you very much for asking. And I noted in the papers that twenty five million pounds uh, is coming to Newham to improve our hospital infrastructure. So perhaps you'd like to tell the committee where that's likely to be spent. Yeah, we, with pleasure. Um, so on Monday of this week, we had uh, a, CT, a brand new CT scanner delivered to the hospital. So we took receipt of our second CT scanner. So by March the 16th, we'll be scanning our first patient on that scanner. So we'll have two CT scanners at the hospital which will allow us to scan more patients uh, quicker. Uh, it also gives us more resilience. So every emergency department needs a, a, a CT scanner. And when your one CT scanner is broken or it needs a service, it, it's, it makes us quite fragile. So that's going to give us a lot more resilience. Um, if any of you drive past the hospital or uh, 
come down to the hospital, you'll see a, a really large uh, extension or wing that we're adding to the hospital. This is this is costing over over twenty million pounds, um, and it's essentially a, a brand new uh, fourteen bedded intensive care unit for the hospital, uh, purpose built for intensive care patients because they need bigger bed spaces and a lot more equipment. So we'll have a brand new intensive care unit uh, which will complete in September. And on the ground floor of the new wing that we're building is a 26 bedded ward. So we'll have additional bed capacity as well uh, by September uh, of this year. Uh, so, so really big investment in the infrastructure at the hospital. Uh, if anybody wants to come down and, and have a look at it, um, I'm happy to give people tours and you can come and see what, what work we're doing around improving the, the structure for the patients of Newham. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'd really like to move us on now because we've got a lot to get through in tonight's agenda, but I can't leave this item without wishing Newham University Hospital a happy 40th birthday, uh, which is coming up. Barking Birth Centre, happy 10th birthday, I note. And also congratulations to on the uh, new intake of uh, 13 interns to your wonderful sort of uh, project search work placements, which, uh, which sorry, provides work placements for local young people uh, with learning disabilities. So congratulations on, on that and thank you for the work you do. Um, now, I'd like to bring a change to the agenda. Uh, with Chair, can I just say one thing before you move on, which is that I think it would be valuable next time the committees that we hear from the Mental Health Trust as well, because we know that there are significant pressures there and I, I know that that would be useful. Fantastic. I think that's a really good idea. And we'll make sure that they get invited in in March, you know, follow, following up on um, the item we did on uh, mental health inequalities as well. Um, now, I'd like to sort of bring a change to the agenda here, because tonight uh, the big item that we're going to be looking at is about primary care. Um, and we've, we've got a really I'm really glad to sort of welcome a big attendance in the chamber this evening. Uh, and for that reason, I'd like to move us on to item nine. So this will be looking at uh, continuing our investigation of system inequalities, as well as taking a deep dive into access to GP services, appointments, the balance of different roles and uh, system oversight as well. So this isn't this item's an opportunity to allow the Commission to assure themselves that resources are being properly focused on reducing health inequalities in the borough, alongside examining whether residents are able to sort of access GP services and obtain appointments as required. So I'm delighted to introduce again Councillor Neil Wilson, our Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care, Councillor Mumtaz Khan as Deputy Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care. Jason Strelitz, Interim Corporate Direction, Director for, of Adults and Health. Uh, Jonathan Cox, our Public Health Consultant. William Cunningham Davis, um, Director of Primary Care Transformation for NHS North East London. Dr. Mohammed Waka Snakfi uh, from North, uh, NHS North East London. Dr. Rima Veit from NHS North East London. Karen Livingston as Chief Executive for Newham Health Collaborative. Dr. Nadeem Farouk, Chairman of Newham Health Collaborative. Uh, and we also have on the Zoom, I know, uh, Veronica DK uh, from Health Watch. Uh, and have we got Julie Powell this evening as well? I'm, in, I'm attending for Julie. Also. Fantastic. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, as we've already introduced, uh, Marie Truman Abel as interim joint Newham Director of Delivery, NHS North East London, uh, and uh, Joe Fraser Wise, interim joint Newham Director of Delivery, NHS North East, North East London. Um, are there any other executive members, officers uh, hoping to participate in this item? So I'd like to turn to Councillor Wilson and Jace, Jason Strelitz to make some brief opening remarks on this item. Yeah, and uh, thank you very much again, Chair, and thanks to colleagues from the primary care sector for their attendance. I mean, it's a very important issue for our residents, clearly, who um, it, it won't be surprised me addressing 
other members of this commission, a lot of our caseworks around um, the ability or otherwise to get appointments with their GP. We have a structural issue with the age profile of GPs, which colleagues in the room will know, and we've been around this debate in previous guises. However, it is also a pleasing time that my own surgery, because we're users of services as well, particularly at the GP level, my own surgery has come um, first in London for the uh, first day appointments as in the top 10 in the UK. I think we need to get that message across rather than the negativity that we sometimes get. There's also a debate which we, we are having, as you well know, within our political party about the future positioning of GPs regarding their, um, you know, positioning, shall we say, within the, the, the health landscape. But there's an important issue, I think, with the Fuller report, which is referred to on page 39, which my colleagues will know more about, how that implementation across what we now, and I've got to be careful because Julie, uh, Marie is on the call, she, uh, she knows that I keep uh, criticising this term, but the North East London Integrated Care Board integrated landscape or whatever it's a landscape but it's also primary care at place and place we mean borough level so there's some really important things i think how we make certain that the integration whether people are actually on integrated care boards or integrated places or whatever that there's a real integration and just the last word for me is that we've obviously got to look at not only the demographic growth within the borough but the structural um, inequalities of funding that we get across that landscape. And I, every time we are, when I introduce a report, I will put that in that context. So it's about resourcing for this particular borough, as you know, historically we haven't had. And uh, there'll be interesting developments of terms around primary care networks and how we can work together to make certain that there is a real development for the access to primary care at the most efficient and accessible level for our residents. But there's a policy thing that I just wanted to bring in. Jason, have you got anything? I have nothing I want to add. I'd, let's hand over to the experts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we have received a lot of uh, papers about your, your, your work in the borough, but I'm just wondering whether anyone would like to sort of give us a sort of brief overview just for anyone who hasn't had a chance to read their papers. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for the kind kind words. I think it, it does summarise the amount of work that primary care has undertaken, and I actually very much is on an upward trajectory. Um, I'm going to hand over to Karen, who helped us pull this paper, just to pull out some key facts. And then I've got some of my clinical colleagues who would, I'd like them to be able to tell you what's happening on the ground and how it feels for them, if that's OK. So hand over thank to you, Will, and councillors. It's um, a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, so one of the things I think you wanted to focus on was access and understandably it's a, a pressure that uh, councillors referenced in terms of uh, members of the public and you'll know in the papers we, we've set out that was over 620,000 appointments um, delivered across the borough um, from the period of June to December and 55% of them were face to face which has been an issue that I think um, lots of members of the public and councillors, I'm sure, will be um, conscious to. Um, and it's also worth noting that 37% of the same day of the request. So there are pressures, um, uh, and we know, and the report gives you some headlines around some of the workforce challenges that we see. Um, Newham is under-doctored in terms of the numbers of GPs we have. We're also under-nursed in terms of the general practice nurses that we have, um, that's something we're working to try and resolve, but it's not um, something we can do in isolation to the rest of the uh, workforce challenges. Um, and then I suppose the other thing just to, to note, and members will be aware that we've had also to respond to emergent issues such as the polio challenge in the summer uh, and the presence of polio in the watercourse in the area, and over 1,700 children have been vaccinated in the the borough to um, enhance their response to that. And then more importantly, the challenge around scarlet fever, um, which probably wasn't an increased prevalence. Uh, well, it wasn't an increased prevalence, but it was an increased anxiety around a lot of patients um, and parents. And again, over 1,100 appointments have been added to our regular offer uh, in the period between December and January to try and address concerns of patients there. The reports you've received got a lot more detail. Really happy to take questions on those. You'll notice that probably one of the most 
evident things from those reports is the variation. Um, and happily, colleagues here from different practices and with real clinical expertise that I don't have will be able to talk to me about that. But I guess I would just slightly caution that some of the variation is driven by coding and the way in which different practices and different parts of the borough work. Some of the pro, uh, variation is driven by the needs of different parts of the borough and different communities. So I think there's a, a mixed story going on here. And before I go to our committee for questions, uh, Veronica, as uh, you work with Health Watch, whose job it is to to the quality of uh, services in the borough, uh, are there any comments you'd like to make? Just to note that at the moment, um, what we're hearing through Health Watch is that quite a few patients are having extensive problems trying to get access to their GPs, which I think is sentiments that we are hearing across the board. So patients are noting that there are longer wait times when trying to get in through reception and we are considering um, doing further research into understanding what those barriers to patients are. And just on that note, I think I noted in the papers, and uh, please do correct me if I'm wrong, was it 37% of people who approach their GP practices managed to get an appointment on the same day? Um, I know there have been issues raised about people being directed to urgent care centres or A&E when they can't get uh, immediate appointments. I mean, are there any comments on, on that you'd like to make before I sort of start looking more generally? Happy and colleagues, so we, um, the GP Federation, which supports obviously the GP practices, also, and um, as commissioned by um, North East London, uh, delivers a number of additional appointments to support the 111 divert service, to support the urgent treatment centre at the hospital, uh, and then also evening and weekend appointments under uh, a programme called Extended Access, which also augment that, you know, regular GP um, delivery. So. There is some additional capacity that is taking the urgent um, primary care uh, service, but we absolutely recognise what um, Health Watch colleagues have said, that there's still challenges in terms of how much that capacity is needed from the scale of demand. And how do people access these extended hours appointments? Because I've heard a lot about this, um, but... I know when I've tried to get an appointment, nobody's ever offered me the option of um, having an appointment in the evening. Um, is there a special route for getting one of those appointments? The appointments, those evening and weekend appointments are managed by the GP practices. So if they see that you have a need and you need to be seen on that day and or they would welcome you being seen that weekend, they will speak to their patients to say, I have an appointment available at, in the evening or at the weekend, and then that can be arranged. But it is the GP practice that will determine, based on you know acuity, the illness of the individual, how those appointments. Start. But I mean, Wax or Nadine or Rima would be able to give you first-hand experience of how they do that. I think just to add to that, I think it's about if the. Um, Factors have already reached their maximum capacity levels on that day, then we have that other service to be able to then book patients that we feel that need to be seen on that day in the services that we have. Um, and the other route is obviously through 111. Again, if they are unable to book that patient into their own practice because of capacity, in terms of already reached maximum capacity, then they can then book them to um, extend access. Um, so that's, that's how it usually works. But it's just worth noting that utilisation of those appointments is running in excess of sort of 80, 90 percent as well. So even with that extension, there's And before I sort of let other people get a word in edgeways, I mean, we, we sort of talked about the shortfall of uh, doctors in, in Newham. Um, large part of the papers you submitted were sort of talking about these new R's roles, sort of additional role support staff, you know, whether you're talking about physicians, associates, community pharmacists, nurse practitioners, care coordinators. 
um, social prescribers, you, you know, they all do very, very good work. And I'm just interested in knowing, you, you know, if you were able to fill those doctors' positions, would you still want those roles to be there? Or are they the, the sticking plaster sort of holding together a system? And if they are, at what point does this go into crisis? Thank you, Francis Master. So uh, the only other points I wanted to make after just responding to your specific question there, I mean, in terms of DRs, we absolutely recognise the multidisciplinary nature of the, 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 the problems that we, we deal with in primary care, the morbidity and the mortality that we face. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, um, so the it, so, so basically talk about the, uh, the, the wider determinants of health, but we actually believe that to be core now. Uh, nine out of 10 patients that I see uh, usually have social problems. So our social prescriber would, do, and that's a classic ours problem. Uh, and um, yes, there is an absolute shortage of clinical workforce, and that's where our workforce such as physicians, associates, and pharmacists play an absolutely fantastic So these are core workforce now in primary care, and that's absolutely what we need. There were some a couple of sort of warnings I wanted to give. There's quite a lot of data that's been presented there. There was quite a lot of data that was presented in the GPAD. What the, 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 the national data didn't show when it was released last year was that 100 plus thousand COVID vaccinations that were delivered by new and primary care. It also doesn't capture the, the wonderful work done by the R's workforce uh, uh, that we've uh, managed to uh, recruit to. Um, in, in terms of the polio, it was 17,000. <laughs> sorry, sorry, not, not seven, 700. Uh, just again to endorse what Councillor Wilson said about the fantastic Bailing Street access on the, 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 the same day. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the, uh, it's not picked up in the data, but that in that same period, Newham became one of the, the first London boroughs to go 100% safe surgeries. I, I don't know whether you're aware of the project that with Doctors of the World, where um, historically, you know, patients have found it really difficult to register with a GP, let alone get an appointment. Uh, and, you know, practices have moved to this uh, safe surgeries uh, model of working and uh, they're, you know, it's we're literally not policing on the doors. If, if somebody from here wants to register with a GP, they should have no obstruction to registration uh, and they will be offered the full suite of universal services that primary care has to offer. We have 100% uptake of the safe surgeries in Europe. Um, there's plenty of variation, see, but what that variation that's shown in this data um, helps us do is to pinpoint that quality improvement work that we are doing to. To, to work with the practices to make sure that we get that capture of what actually primary care are, are doing. Despite being significantly uh, understaffed, underfunded, uh, and of course the pressure of the full kind of bandwidth of determinants of health that um, uh, I really do believe that uh, primary care have done a, 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 fa a fantastic job uh, with partners uh, in delivering uh, uh, the really, really high levels of, of access. Now, the report says 600,000, but I believe that to be much closer to the, you know, the, 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 the million, the seven-figure mark. Uh, and that is, if you take into account the 100,000 plus COVID vaccinations, the numbers of polio vaccines, and other uh, interventions and interactions that primary care has, that is really the problem with the data, and that data does not uh, capture that full scope. The only thing I'd also add is in terms of there is a kind of a shift now for general practice. Some of it is due to a lack of um, general practitioners in, in, in England. If you compare us to, say, a lot of Europe, we're about 50% down in terms of GP of population. Um, but also there's um, an aging population, more comorbidity. So the role of general practitioner has changed. So we're becoming more, we're seeing more complex patients, patients who would have been seen in the hospital in outpatients. Even a decade ago, we're seeing in primary care, an example is diabetes. We, we, we see most of our patients, um, very few of them go to the hospital 10, 15 years ago. Even when I started with a GP, most patients were seen in hospital wards, and you can expand that to lots of chronic conditions such as COPD. Um, and part of that is the direction of travel. And, and I think it's unlikely we're going to go the other way. Um, and part of that is the aging population um, and a lack of general practitioners, that mismatch between demand and supply 
Um, so, you know, we're, we welcome the additional resource we have with clinical pharmacists, physician associates to do some of the work we used to do, and um, it's become more of a team approach. One of the things I wanted to pick up on was um, inequalities. This has been the focus of um, this commission in the current year. Um, and we, we've looked at inequalities in maternity. We've looked at inequalities affecting mental health. Um, and I know that uh, primary care networks were all expected by the government to identify particular equalities that they would focus on and do specific short pieces of work uh, attempting to sort of address those. And there was some information about what happened in uh, the work that's been done in Newham in the papers for this meeting. And I'm just wondering if, some, if someone can say something briefly about the kind of inequalities that have been identified and just any good practice that's been found and also what's going to happen to that learning. So I'm very aware that um, you, you could have an inequality identified within one primary care network. And just to be clear, each primary care network is a cluster of GP practices. So it will be practices in one part of Newham, but it could be that this issue is, and it probably is experienced in other parts of the borough. So how do we ensure that this learning, any learnings captured and that the rest of the borough feels the benefits? I mean, we've got quite, I think we've got nine PCMs, yeah. um, 46 or so practices. They're all, they're all doing projects on health inequalities um, and they're, the, the CDs who are the GP or often GP leads for these PCNs are coming together and they're working individually on their project on their PCNs but also collectively across Newham and that's the shared learning um, and the sharing of, of, of um, projects. So what, what have they learned? So the, the primary care networks come together every month um, and uh, so they've taken on some projects around cancer screening. So uh, some of them are um, doing uh, a range of different uh, sort of data trawls, making sure that they're identifying patients that for whatever reason are more vulnerable or haven't been screened um, as per the expectations. Uh, some of those patients, um, they will be offered appointments in their practice, but some of them will also be offered um, support through our roving team, which is a sort of an outreach team that um, um, reaches to some of the groups that perhaps are more vulnerable and have challenge in terms of uh, accessing mainstream services. We've also had work um, within specific um, PCNs on migrant communities uh, and some of the health um, challenges that the uh, bridging hotels have been uh, having. Uh, I know that some of the PCNs are currently working on, although we haven't seen the learning come through, what they can do around access to dental care and the uh, relationship between um, what's happening in primary care and dentistry. And then there have been some specific targets, in fact, that um, NAPRI has been involved around food poverty and some weight management schemes, uh, and then specific um, support around some of the pressures in terms of um, that we've seen this winter around uh, crisis and challenge for individuals who've got sort of living pressures. So there's a number of different projects. Each of those are reported across the whole borough and within each of the primary care networks. So really happy to send councillors further information, but I don't know if Dr. Macri, you yeah, your projects. I mean, you, 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 you've articulated um, uh, how they, the, the PCNs work together to address identify and address these inequalities and you know the wonderful action that you've described around the roving team presented and um, you know historically we had a situation where we really struggled over a six-month period between September and, and February and March to, to get blue jabs to our most vulnerable residents and you know that was absolutely recognized by the PCNs and the free, uh, the, 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 the the primary care network and, and, and partners and and the action to uh, introduce a, a, a roving team uh, through lots of QI work um, has had fantastic impact into and, and we're able to uh, share some fabulous data which we're able to get to our uh, 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 nursing home and care home residents uh, before any other borough and, and, and really significant uh, uptake that we uh, achieved, uh, which was absolutely fantastic. And that was not through just this winter phase, but previous 
four phases of the uh, 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 pa pandemic. And generally, I think I think IMSS and screening it was a big one that the the, the, the PCNs have, have been focused on. It's great that we're able to identify. It's get great that we're able to come together to address these inequalities. Um, but what we are, and I'll be uh, open and uh, transparent and report to the committee, is that uh, we're able to push to a point, uh, to a point where we get to the point where a state uh, uh, and, and lack of um, a pro a proper estate to support ARS staff, that, for example, that we've mentioned who are heavily involved in these programs, um, uh, uh, and, and access uh, the, the the gap in terms of funding there is for new and practices. Uh, we have one practice, the Conflict Society, is in fact there's a gap of 2,000 weighted versus raw patients. So we're paid for X number of patients, but we only receive uh, Y in terms of uh, funding. And that is significant. We're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that is evident in other practices uh, across Newham. So yeah, there's some fabulous work going on and we're able to push and push and push. Um, uh, but we do get reports back that we got to the stage where a state resource um, uh, and, 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 and people power in, in terms of workforce is really, really, really quickly. And, and you know, it's it's kind of a plea to all those on the call and, and all those uh, uh, here in the room that um, if we could work together to to, to support, to, to, to push for the, the right kind of resource in terms of uh, people power and uh, financial uh, resource to be able to, to go that extra yards that we absolutely need to go for our residents. But in terms of estates, I, I remember, you know, going back to my days in Cabinet, and I'm sure Councillor Wilson sort of be involved in this, um, we had a brilliant partnership, Health and Care Space Newham, to create a whole new generation of uh, glossy health hubs. And we've got Pontoon Dock, um, we've got the uh, Hartley Centre development. We've got a development within Queen's Market. I think there's one in Custom House. What's happened to that? I mean, maybe that's a, a question for Councillor Wilson in terms of um, uh, from the council angle. Um, I think. A, I, think I, I mean, I can care yeah, really. Yeah, really. Yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, I mean. Uh, they'll pick up on the health and care space, which I, I believe is uh, delivered fantastic estate, and we know that. Um, uh, but we know that uh, we can only keep the, the growth in you is exponential. This report talks about three hundred and fifty thousand. I know for a fact, when I count up all my practices in my practice, our practices in there, um, that we uh, uh, we're, we're we're touching four hundred and twenty thousand plus GP registered patients, which is a huge differential from the GLA estimate. So a, a lot of the planning and development and the state often is based on such kind of estimates, uh, and you know. Um, uh, but actually, what we see on the ground is 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 very very different, uh, and um, it, you know we need significant more amounts of, state, especially with the growth that is that we're seeing. It, we we have fantastic bits of kit which is able to tell every practice how much our list sizes are growing, and that is well in excess of what the GLA estimates ever would be, uh, and and any kind of uh, resort estate planning that there is. I know there's a fantastically big piece of work going on with uh, North East London around, um, you know, the Barking Riverside and the growth around the Canning Town area. Uh, uh, and uh, we've already seen uh, health facilities uh, uh, developed in, in, in those areas. Uh, but um, absolutely, we need to make sure that we're not just catching up, keeping up with the, the tail of the situation. We need to get ahead. We absolutely need to get ahead to provide the access that absolutely our population needs and demands. So we know that our population's growing in Newham, but um, 420,000 seems excessive. What what work do you do to actually check how many of uh, the patients on the list are still in, in Newham? I mean, can I just add to that? Because in Newham, we have, uh, we have the, the largest um, uh, number of EU migrants who apply for settled status by a huge amount. And it was a complete shock to us, um, the amount of people there. But we suspect a lot of people are not, you know, have used a new address in the past, and, but are not here now. Is this possibly the same? Well, uh, I, can, um, I would just say on that point, um, individual practices do are asked to for sort of cleanse their list and there were significant a number of kind of what we call ghost patients mm. and that's an exercise that's done on a regular basis 
Um, but I know that in other boroughs, we've seen that actually during the COVID vaccination scheme, there were a sudden surge of number of patients unregistered for the COVID vaccination, and certainly in Tower Hamlets. And I think that's also been within Newham. We haven't yet actually looked at that. They don't have got their specific figures, but I, I, I assume that actually there was a, a large surge um, for the vaccination who are now not, not accessing general practice at the moment. But it's just more about individual practices, making sure that they are doing their cleansing of their lists is really important. And it's important for us to recognise the figures and long term conditions, all these sorts of things. It's really important that we, know, we understand what our cohort is in our practice. So it's up to each individual practice to do that on a regular basis. But how do you cleanse your, your, your list? I mean, that sounds quite drastic. I mean, I very rarely access my local uh, practice. So would there be a danger that um, I might suddenly find that I'm not on the list of my practice? I mean, do you literally call everybody? It's, it's, no, it's, I think it's in terms of having access to five years. So, yeah, so there's an NHS England programme of uh, list cleansing where flags are set for practices from the point of view of patients that they haven't again, been, been active for three to five years. That was, that list cleansing exercise was paused during COVID. Because obviously we didn't want to inadvertently re un unregister patients, but actually the, the stipulation is for practices to be able to contact their patients by different means to ensure that they still live at the address that they're, um, they're, they're registered to. So that will be letters and telephone calls, et cetera. But where a, pra and a practice will, will then either take the take the flag off the fp69 flag and that patient remains on the list or actually that flag goes on and then actually that patient becomes unregistered and their records are held in suspense until they re-register again somewhere else if i can move on the fuller report has been mentioned and a lot of that is about um having a more integrated approach to services at a primary care level and having a more holistic approach. So you have multidisciplinary teams where you'll have a group of um, professionals representing different areas who, you know, say if you had somebody who had financial issues, mental health issues, uh, physical health issues, would, would be looking at that person's health in the round. But equally, uh, the Fuller report is also about the value of co-production and having resident and voluntary sector voices and sort of having a greater focus on prevention. Um, I declared an interest at the beginning of the meeting in the sense that I'm involved in um, a, a kind of quite complex uh, co-production project that's bringing residents together with health and care professionals in uh, Hackney and City to establish where gaps might be in services and try and reduce health inequalities. But I'm not aware of any of that work going on in Newham at the moment. So are there any ambitions to start doing that kind of work? And if, if so, what form will it take? And will it involve partnering with the council in our community neighbourhoods? Would you like me to move on to the fuller presentation? Um, if it was well, certainly in terms of the co-production elements, I'd... so 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 for me, is we we you know we've got the fuller report, and again, happy to go through it again. But I think that's exactly right. It's fuller is not just about primary care; it's actually about the stakeholder. And our colleague was talking very much about local partnership, Newham, not Nell Newham. But actually, this is very much a Nell kind of project and program that sits across the seven boroughs in northeast London of the buckets that we've put forward, but actually it's then very much about how do we, as a new organisation and partners, wrap around it. And again, it's great to hear that you're doing fabulous work in City and Hackney, because actually we haven't, we haven't even gone down that road of what do we need to do at a place-based kind of view. So happy to take those learnings. And that's the, the whole idea of the escalator kind of the resource coming from Nell to support the partnerships to be able to develop each of these pathways. And, you know, again, we're talking about estates, we're talking about all of those kind of people enablers. Again, it's to share that learning. So we're not re-replicating the wheel seven different times. Can I just add on that point, just in terms of, in my other round of the Clinical Partnership, there are, we are in the process of trying to see how we can get the voluntary sector involved in that, in within the partnership. And in terms of neighbourhoods, we are piloting a neighbourhood approach in Docklands PCN. And that is through co-production with the residents as well. So that's just our initial step. And that's our first PCN that we have 
on board to see how we can pilot, how a neighbourhood could look. There are some PCNs that are ahead of the game, so let's say in terms of practice, practice and, and they've already established an, a kind of neighbourhood approach. But what you want to do is replicate that in other areas of PCN networks that may not be efficiently working as well as they can do. And it's kind of piloting how, what a neighbourhood approach is like. And that's based on the fuller report. Um, and, you know, you're absolutely right. It's co-designing not only with, with, with the residents, but also with councillors, because we know that you are, have, are in touch with our residents more so than we are. We just see them clinically for 10 minutes and that's it. So it's kind of using that knowledge we have within the borough to try and say, OK, what is needed in this particular network and neighbourhood and, and build it based on what the needs are of the population as well. I've absolutely held this section, but I've, I've got one more question and then I'm going to shut up and let the rest of the committee get a word in edgeways and apologies for this, but it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to have had exposure to this. So there are just a few pieces of ground I want to cover before I sort of throw open. And the other question that I think leads on from this is just about the creation of the PCNs in, in Newham, because at the time, uh, I remember there was quite a conversation around how these should be organised and, you, you know, as a borough, we have fairly sort of mature geographically based community neighbourhoods that would have been a great model and, you know, in Hackney they have that very geographically sort of focus and I'm just wondering whether all the chickens have kind of come home to ro roost that we said would turn out to be problems at the time the PCNs came together and whether there's a chance now that people will see the benefits of having PCNs that are based on geographical areas that our residents recognise and might sort of rethink some of the boundaries? Uh, yeah, uh, spot on. Um, I mean, I think we had a, a, an event uh, five months ago where we had exactly that conversation about neighbourhoods. Again, looking at modelling of the work that's been done um, not only in Newham, but again in Waltham Forest and other boroughs around 15-minute neighbourhoods, and very much taking that challenge back to the to the, to the PCN and to practices to say, is this really the right kind of construct and right space? And are you too small? Are you too big? And actually, how do patients actually access healthcare within your locality or within your PCN? So very much challenging the status quo. And there certainly was an appetite of around change I think is, is around how do we validate that and then what services can be wrapped around within our partners and our stakeholders for that PCN or neighbourhood to work. Um, so so, so it, that, that is part and parcel of the, the whole kind of fuller conversation of what's, uh, you know, if you've said, let's say, if you said we have a hub in each, in each, um, in each neighbourhood or each, in each um, PCN, what would you put into that hub? What other services could be delivered from said hub? And that kind of patient benefit of, of, of working that through. So, yeah, we, we are working through that. OK, Jason, I saw you, you had your hand up. Um, is there something you'd like to come in with? No, it's with kind of the conversation moved on. It's OK. OK, sorry. Rest of the committee, I'm, 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 I owe you all a, a huge <laughs> apology for having sort of completely hogged that. Um, are there any questions that anybody would like to ask? Come in. Councillor uh, Falola. Yeah, tell me, Falola, is that I know nothing is absolute, and people have talked gloriously about what they've been doing. But I'm going to take you to my the people I've saw who came to the surgery to complain about anything. I've got three people in mind. The first person uh, said he had to make an appointment on the phone. And the appointment, you have to phone a certain time. If you fail to phone at that time, you won't get an appointment for the day. And uh, he has prostate cancer. So he's been struggling to have an appointment. He never had that appointment. The second person, uh, she went to, she has breast uh, cancer. She's been treated. So she went to surgery. And uh, she was go, uh, she went to the dentist for teeth treatment. And uh, when she got there, they wanted to pay to her car. And they said, you have uh, this uh, uh, card from so so something. You're not supposed to pay. So she was treated. It didn't pay. 
But a month later, she got a letter that says she's been fine because she meant she's supposed to pay for that treatment. He said, look, I paid it and the payment was canceled. I still have the paper. They said, no, you have to go and pay and you can find it now. He showed me the paper. He showed me how to pay it. And I'm just wondering, what's going on? So we sent the letter and they said, we have to send it to another department. We tell me. I just wonder, why do you think this is happening? So that dentistry, which does our dental access, was yeah. it? So that, I, I think that's obviously a, a terrible mistake, I suggest. Um, and obviously, uh, that if she again is entitled to free dental care, then she should have received it. Um, and certainly, we can obviously pick that up from from if it hasn't been um, resolved from the payments authority, then we can intervene. Um, so again, it's, uh, like we can report that back to NHS England for from the dental team because that shouldn't have happened. Not only that, she was meant to, she was asked to pay back. She was fine as well. Yeah, no, no, no it, and it, but it, but I think it's and that's where we would need to do the investigation. Obviously, not from point of view of what uh, did the dental practice put down on her records, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, as if the dental practice said actually, if she's got a, um, I can't think what the card's called, but an exemption card, then actually that should have been recorded on her records. So then it would have followed through on the computer system back to the BSA. Um, so she shouldn't have even been fined because actually it should have flagged on the system that she wasn't she didn't need to pay any kind of patient charges or or any treatment. So I think that's just unfortunately been a terrible mistake. But if that isn't resolved, then please you come back to me and I'll pick it up with the dental team at NHS England. Um, just on the uh, same day, I don't know whether my colleagues might want to chip in, but um, it's disappointing to hear um, from that point of view because obviously Karen's talked. Um, certainly around the appointment data, and obviously 38% of our residents do get an on-the-day appointment, um, but also we've, we've, add, we've added additional capacity for on-the-day appointment. So where a practice does reach that kind of capacity, there is an, ex, an extra kind of capacity within the, ex, the, the treatment hubs, et cetera, or the, the extended access for, for that same-day treatment. Um, but again, as if there are specifics, happy to, to take those away and look into them. Um, but, but again, it's disappointing to hear, I suppose, um, because we have not just said, right, actually, you know, general practice is struggling. We know that they're, they're busy, busy, busy. So we actually have commissioned, you know, of the Karen and her, and her team to add that extra capacity. It won't always be enough. No, totally. Um, but actually, there is there is quite a healthy kind of additional capacity there for same day activity so that people don't need to go to AME or even to the UTT. UTT. Talking about um, GP capacity, um, there was a lot of attention given to the uh, documentary around uh, a practice that wasn't actually in, in you and run by Operos. Now, obviously, Operos do have six practices in, in Newham. And also, as a counsellor, I've been approached by residents who've claimed that practices not run by uh, this, this private company um, have uh, informed them that there's no GP cover on particular on a, a particular date. Um, so I'm really interested in knowing how, um, and, and this might be a question to the people from the NEL system, um, how you, you, you can oversee uh, GP practices and have that assurance that the level of GP coverage that our residents should be getting and that those practices are promising is there is actually being delivered. Um, so we've been in many a conversation about our pros, haven't we, on various team calls, etc. During COVID, um, one of the things, obviously, the the fact finding and data and investigation, certainly around the pros, um, that has been done. But what we also have done is actually gone out to all of the other practices, so actually treating them exactly the same as everybody else to gain that assurance from the point of view of looking at the, 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 the numbers of appointments that are on their book system, so the, um, what's known as the Carhill formula from 72, per, 72 appointments per 1,000 registered patients and what is their appointment book saying, and that's both on um, telephone, face-to-face -face, and uh, online kind of capacity. So again, very much about looking at people's rotors and that kind of um, conversation. So that's actively been done certainly by the primary care teams and the contracting teams. But also on top of that, practices also have to declare, so what's known as an EDEC submission 
that every practice have to have to do a self declaration, which again is a, a national filter that then where questions are or aren't aren't answered or flags, then they will be they will go and be investigated by the teams. And it just might be worth members being aware that obviously part of that validation comes through the CQC process and their oversight across the borough. And again, in the paperwork that was submitted, you'll have seen that whilst there's always still the occasional challenge and need for improvement, the borough has improved considerably over the last period around the CQC assessment. So I believe that the data in 2017 uh, place Newham at sort of 206 out of 207 practices across uh, uh, areas across the country, whereas uh, the data is now showing that sort of 95.8% of our practices are rated good or above. There's still improvement, and I'm no, never we're never going to say that that can't improve, but part of that um, assessment is the presence of GPs on site um, and so, for example, the extended access service we've talked about, GPs have to be on site uh, as part of that provision. So never say never, but there are fail safes and checks. Uh, and I think if you are getting those messages, I'd want to hear yeah. those. Yeah. OK. And I... No, it's just coming in. Uh, Will's been very admirable, and uh, I know he would take uh, sort of queries that come from councillors and, and stuff like that. Um, but uh, the, in terms of the extended appointments that we took, uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not one to be defensive, but I mean, the programme's been running for about two months and we had about a month or so just October. October yeah. And it was, a, it was a plenty of co-production there, wasn't it? We had some fantastic responses from our residents in designing the, uh, 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 what is clear and, and, and what, what we're seeing from comments and, and and the feedback we receive from our, our patients and, and our patient participation groups, Health Watch, Groundswell, etc. Um, that, um, th th there's some work that we need to do around communicating what's out there as well. Uh, right. There are so many routes that patients can take. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just come from a long period where you know the, the routes call one 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 if you've got COVID, etc. Mm -hmm. And stuff. so we've we've moved, so we've moved into a different phase in that kind of education work that we need to do uh, uh, with our uh, uh, re um, uh, residents and, and patients. And absolutely, uh, uh, we, 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 we'd love to do that. And of course, work with counsellors uh, uh, and, you know, any complaints that you you have in your, in your council surgeries, do report that back to the team and then we'll absolutely look to investigate. On the point of the, the, the dental, um, Good news. I, I think, you know, historically, NHS England have commissioned those services, but uh, just to put a record that from April 2023, we expect that the dental contracting, the, the work around commissioning dental services, elements of it will be uh, retained back to um, ICS footprints and ICB. So, uh, yeah, so that I hope uh, with, you know, working alongside primary care, ophthalmology and pharma, we'll be able to um, influence and make sure um, uh, and able to uh, uh, address some of the challenges that the councillor has uh, presented today. I mean, I don't, I'm deliberately trying not to wander into dental work too much because that's, that's going to be what we're looking at in our next meeting. And I was very interested to see that, as you say, one of the focuses of um, GP inequalities work concerned dentistry. So we might well sort of call them to sort of talk about that at our next meeting. Next meeting, Chair. And uh, March 12th? March. 14th of March. But just, just um, if, if I, if I uh, indulge you, certainly. So, so dental optimum and pharmacy um, is obviously being delegated by NHS England to each ICS in the country, as Wax was saying, as of first April. Um, London um, is is slightly different. So, actually, although it's all being delegated to each of the five ICSs, North East London actually is is going to be hosting the whole dental optimum and pharmacy team on behalf of all of the other ICSs. Um, so actually, as Wax was saying, actually, it is recognised that North East London is a massive, um, has a massive need for that extra kind of capacity and water load within, but in, in, certainly in dentistry. Um, and as, as Wax was saying, the, there is a national contract, which is quite clunky from the point of view of dentistry. However, the team will be much more local. So we will have much more kind of oversight and ownership for dentistry, optum, and pharmacy. 
Um, so that's why, and that, and the team aren't moving. We have a message from Julian Arbett. <laughs> like he wants to be involved too. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, the team won't move over to the ICS until the ICS until the first of July. Um, but I'm actually leading that program for Nell ICS. Okay, so you'll be back next month. I was actually going to see whether we could move it into later into the year. Well, the, well, the team are actually within within the, the ICS. I still, I still think but, it would be good to lead into that because that was fine. That's fine, Chair. when when I first got my chair. Um, there were, there were two issues that residents raised massively, not being able to get a GP appointment and the problem of dentists. And I know from my own dentist that there's a massive waiting list even to have checkups at the moment. Um, I just wanted to touch on one more thing before we move off the topic. I mean, uh, firstly, you were, you were talking about the phone system, phone uh, services, 111? Yeah. Have you ever come across anyone who's had a good experience of that phone system? Because I, I genuinely haven't, I have to say, and I've never heard anything good from residents, but you're talking as if it's a great success story. So I'm just wondering if you can give some examples of, um, and, and uh, Veronica, have you heard any any good feed, positive feedback about the uh, phone service ever at HealthWatch? On the whole, it's largely quite, negative but there have been a few instances of residents having a positive experience but it's very dependent on the time a resident calls so if a resident calls I don't know late at night when it's a bit less busy that's maybe when we've heard that they've had a bit more positive experiences but on the whole we've heard experiences about long wait times still left on hold for quite a long time um, and sometimes feeling frustrated with the advice that they're receiving so this might be one for a, a, another meeting, to be quite honest, because we are kind of drifting out of, but I just wanted to mention that quickly before we wrap up, I just wanted to get on to the more integrated side. I mean, you were talking about um, the, the uh, experience of migrants in terms of inequalities. And I'm just wondering, you, you know, you were talking about temporary housing, given that we're in an integrated care system now, which I'm hoping is working at all levels, how much partnership work you're doing with the council in terms of sort of addressing issues like that which would partly come under public health I that's when i what i was going to say yeah. uh, when i thought the conversation moved on so i just say i mean we do a huge amount of partnership work so um we have our um our well known program which is our social prescribing focus where we've collectively collaborated i think with every pcn around the investment in a new digital platform which is going to support social prescribing that's slowly being rolled out now. And again, I think lots of primary care have been on training on that already. And that's that's big, big new developments. That's been a you know 100 percent collaboration. And then we have um we have PCNs actively involved with the health equity program, which is the program that Adiola is leading, which is all about um different parts of our health and care system um improving how they um achieve uh, equitable outcomes um for their patients. And then we do very collaborative population health initiatives. So um, Wax talked earlier about the roving team, you know, that was development in response to an you know, collectively identified gap. We've got work that's trying to improve our response to refugees and asylum seekers, work around homelessness. So, so it's about that, that collaboration, both the kind of whole borough piece around prevention and the specific population health work, as well as um, the integrated health and care work. So the kind of so, more social care side of things so I think there's very very I, I feel incredibly positive collaboration that we have in Newham and in terms of mental health when we were sort of looking at inequalities in mental health um primary care was brought up uh by some of the um community groups who had attended as a, a real weak point is there anything that we're doing to sort of strengthen that response given that primary care is absolutely on the front line and and the general view is that the doctor should be the first point uh, uh, re reporting any issues. As, as part of the mental health transformation, um, I think we we'll call it a project scheme, um, is actually bringing uh, mental health specialists closer to the community. So within primary care, within PCN networks, we have a mental health team that consists of a consultant, a psychologist, 
um, and then even in social care as well in terms of housing. You no, know, actually, a lot of it is actually linked in terms of some social care deprivation and mental health. So actually, that's brought a lot of that service closer to primary care, and that sort of happened just pre-COVID. But we're actually seeing the benefits of that now, more post-pandemic. So. We do, we have seen um, a lot of increase in mental health in primary care. I know it's been presented previously through Health Watch as well um, in health and wellbeing boards and our partnership boards. We do recognise that that is uh, certainly on the increase and, and we're certainly seeing it on the front line. And we are managing it more in general practice. I'm not gonna lie, you know, in terms of before it was probably more um, lower levels and now we're probably managing more low to medium. Mm -hmm. But we do have that um, each network, as I said, has that mental health team, which we can refer into. And I think the general feedback has been actually received quite positively within the primary care setting. And do you feel you've got sufficient capacity to deal with the level of need, given that I think I read somewhere that um, mental health uh, service demands up by 40% since the pandemic? I think you know, the capacity, <laughs> we can never say we have enough capacity. There is always going to be that challenge. And it's just about how we are reacting to it and how we are putting things in place to try and support that. But I know that certainly from we, what we know from primary care, they're working extremely hard to, to help and make sure that these patients are seen. Yeah. And, and We're also doing a project with the Deanery, which builds on some of the great work that they've done in Tower Hamlet, yeah. children and young people, and mental health, and how we, it's not just about capacity, but how you reach out to those patients, young patients, and in a different way maybe. And we're doing a project at Croft Newham at the moment. Yeah colleagues on that and the learning will hopefully you know, to allow us to connect uh, more with our young people and with, with mental health issues. Fantastic. Um, Go Fraser Wise, I'm being told that uh, you, you might, you, you would like to speak on the topic. Uh, no, I had my hand up earlier, but Rima actually covered, when you were asking about co-production, I was going to say exactly as Rima had said, that we had, um, we've got a number of projects which have been co-produced, looking at um, neighbourhoods and also a frailty pilot happening, um, which has very much been produced with our residents. So um, thank you, Chair, but it was, uh, it was not on this item, it was on a previous question. So. I'm really sorry for that. I didn't um, see a hand go up, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to bring this particular item to a close and I'd, I'd like to extend a particular vote of thanks to all the primary care people who made the effort to come to East Ham Town Hall tonight. Uh, so I would now like to re return to our original agenda. And uh, I think I'd like to do the item set, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'm terribly <laughs> sorry. If if you want to stay, you're very welcome to. <laughs> Thank you very kind of. We're probably going to go home and watch it on the, on the uh, <laughs> watch it back. Right. <laughs> no, I'm terribly sorry. You're Steve. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to move on to item seven, um, looking at the social care assurance development work. Uh, so I'll just find that place. Going back. So in April 2022, the new Health and Care Act gave the CQC the additional right to inspect how local authorities were meeting their social care duties as laid out in the Care Act of 2014. Given the consequences this could have for our local authority, this is an important area for our Commission to consider uh, uh, to inform the Commission on the preparedness of the Council to receive a high rating once CQC inspections start. Now I'm delighted to welcome for this item Councillor Neil Wilson, Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care. Uh, Councillor Mumtaz Khan, uh, Deputy Cabinet Member for Health and Adults. Jason Strelitz, Interim Corporate Director of Adults and Health. Charlotte Taylor, uh, Director of Improvement, Change and Control, Adults and Health. And Claire Soley, uh, Director of uh, Quality Assurance, Safeguarding and Workforce Development and Tony Jobling, Director of uh, Operations Adult Social Care. So I'm very pleased that you'll all be joining us for this item. Uh, are there any additional officers uh, present who would like to uh, introduce themselves to this item? Um, so 
We looked at this item in some depth in our previous meeting, uh, where we did cover a number of areas, including uh, the themes the CQC were, are going to be focusing on and the legislative uh, context and our duties under the CARE Act. Um, so I'd like Councillor Neil Wilson uh, to make some opening remarks regarding this item. Uh, but if they could sort of focus more on development since the last meeting and uh, the work undertaken to sort of bring us up to speed, just any changes that have happened oh, since I pick that bring up? It. Yeah, I get, I, I'll pass straight over to Jason um, just to say before he does, though, that I want to thank the, the team because I think it's important and I think it's important because it's a, a public broadcast that we're having that uh, uh, seek CQC, any social care assurance development framework has to be seen in the context that we uh, we want our services to be at the best possible uh, quality for our residents, but it's a very difficult landscape, as you know, Chair, but that doesn't give us any cause for complacency. We can learn from other areas and best practice and about where we might identify strengths and weaknesses. That's exactly where we're at the development stage and over to Jason and the team, but thanks for all their work on it. So the only thing briefly I would say by way of update, and Claire may, may add something on top, is that we're still operating with a draft framework, but what we've been doing is working um, as a leadership team across all parts of adults and health to really baseline where we are and assess where we are across the aspects of the, of the areas that we, that we believe the CQC will be exploring. Um, so we've been doing a series of... Um, quite an intensive series of workshops, um, really, really trying to do that baselining exercise. Claire, do you want to add a bit more? Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, just to add some more information, I mean, this is still a huge I do still wait signing up from the Secretary of State for two different parts of the insurance framework. So one is the actual framework itself, which I provided the detail um, at the previous meeting. And the second is the handbook, which provides a type of evidence and the way that the framework will be put into practice. So they are quite, the, the signing off of the assurance framework is quite delayed. So we were looking for that to be signed off in the bottom last year. So that is creating some delay for the CPP in terms of the so what's being described now is a soft launch in April, rather than the, the full launch that we're initially going to take together. Um, we're making really good progress. Um, as Jason, Jason said, um, we are working through the four themes. We've done three of the four themes already. One still worked through. There has been nothing unexpected that's come out of our search testing so far. But there are some broad themes which I've detailed on slide 16. Um, but in saying that, those themes um, are things that we already had in our current work plans and key priorities and objectives in adults and health. So there's nothing I feel I need to escalate in terms of that. And the other bits I'd just like to highlight very quickly are we are going to be participating in peer review that's been undertaken by Associate Directors of Adult Social Services. But what that means is our officers will go to another local authority to uh, peer review them, and that will obviously be insightful for us in terms of feedback. And the second point I'd like to add is that we are also going to have a peer review under the same framework, and we're looking for that to take place in late autumn. We need to agree what the theme will be, and we're not going to do that until we finish the final theme, the deep dive into the final theme. Um, we're making really good progress. I think we're making really good progress comparable to other local authorities in London, because we're connected to the networks. Um, our next step um, will be to finalise our action plan, so our areas that we want to focus on. And the next step that will run um, after that will be our engagement with staff, residents, our partners, elected members and senior officers in the local authority. 
um, because it, the CQC will look at this as our whole system, and it's not just about the local authority. So I'll stop there and um, any questions. So how are you planning to go about uh, engaging with our whole system? So it will look different depending on um, which bit of the system we want to engage with. We are going to start with our staff, and um, so it's really important really, really that they are staff are aware of what we are doing to prepare for this assurance. Um, that we understand their views, their understanding of the different aspects. So we do workshops, we do the streaming with staff. We'll then set up separate sessions with residents, and we need to think about how best to do that at this point, certainly using our existing um, frameworks and pathways that we have in place. Um, similarly, with partners, and um, it won't just be a one session, and that's us made you aware and got your view, this will be a journey, so this will continue to develop as we work through um, um, our engagement with different people. And depending on what we hear back, we may wish to revisit certain areas um, and we'll take on board, obviously, people's comments as we develop our action plans. And Charlotte and Tony, I'm terribly sorry, um, did you have anything that you wanted to add to what's been said? Um, do I have any questions from uh, the committee? Councillor Verdi. Okay, in that case, I've I've got a couple. Um, I'm interested in. I mean, in, in slide thirty six, uh, there's some talk about where we believe our strengths lie, and we talk about our high quality borough provision. When you talk about that, what are you referring to? Um, so on this slide, what we try to do is give broad themes of the areas that we think we need to strengthen at this stage. So when we have highlighted high quality and well provision, we are um, referring to our domicile and care services and our care homes. So we recognise that the CQC, because the CQC, um, as their first soft launch April, are likely to look at um, our data that's publicly available. So that will be the ratings for CQC in terms of our domiciliary care, extra care shelters um, and care homes. So we recognise there are pockets where that needs to improve um, and that's a continual process, notwithstanding the real challenges that sector's faced over the last two years. So you're not actually saying that we, we do have a high quality uh, provision, you're, you're accepting the fact that our provision at, in actual fact at the moment is, is quite mixed, you know, allowing for the fact that, uh, you know, there are challenges within the entire care system and that it's privately provided. So it's not something that we, we directly control. Yeah, exactly. So we have an, an ongoing rolling quality assurance and um, framework that we, we implement in terms of our quality of care and support delivered. There are really good examples of that and there are areas where it needs to be strengthened and improved. Um, and that is, that's not unique to Newham, um, that's something that we're seeing nationally. And uh, we're, we're well aware of where those pockets are. And uh, we've got really good relationships with our providers and we're engaging with them in a supportive, collaborative way to help them make the required improvements. So we're confident we will get it. So you're saying that late autumn for the action plan. So would that be when will that conclude, or um, and, and when would be a good time for scrutiny to call you back to update us? So we hope to we're on track to finish our deep dive by the end of March. And um, the soft launch for CQC will be April. Our peer review will be the end of autumn, I think, around about that time. So it might be helpful to come back after that at some point, because we, we, I think that would be helpful to understand the outcome of the peer review. Fantastic. Has anyone got any further questions about how we're approaching this assurance that could end up with our borough? I mean, hopefully it will end up our borough having a very good rating. Uh, but does anyone have any sort of further questions or points they want to raise? May I just add one more point? Is that the yes, absolutely. Um, so when the CQC finalise their assessment of the borough, it's highly unlikely that anything will be published on a website for at least a year. 
So on that basis, if they finish collecting the data, say by the end of this year, it's unlikely that anything will be published on a website for another year after that. And the reason for that is they're benchmarking at the moment and getting a feel for where things are at. So just, just to say that as well, but they will let us know internally what, what the outcome of that would be. Fantastic. Uh, Councillor Laguda. Yes, I have to worry about the self-assessments because when you do self-assessments, at times you overrate yourself. And then at the end of the day, you are not actually uh, saying the right things that are happening. You just want to, to pass. You know, let's call it pass. Because I remember when I used to do the CQC, it was a lot of preparation. But if you have to do self-assessments, I worry. Because I know what it means when you are doing self-assessment. If let's say I should do self-assessment of myself, of course, I'm going to give myself uh, positive things rather than looking at it holistically. So can you tell me how, how we are going to tackle that one? Because it's quite difficult. Sure. Easy. Yep. So we are being critical friends to each other in the in the meetings that we're having. I mean, my role within adults and health is around improving practice, understanding where there are gaps. So that's part of my day-to-day -day function anyway. Um, we recognize that this is the real opportunity for us, and we have to be honest improvements. And that's absolutely spirit it's intended. The final point I would add to that is it all has to be evidence-based. So I can sit in these meetings and say, I think this is fantastic. Someone else will say, well, where's the evidence to prove that? So anything we're stating has to be underpinned by evidence. I think in you other words, everything you do, you have to quantify it. Yes, you have to quantify it with uh, proof. And I think you're also talking about peer reviews where you would yeah. be we would be reviewed by another borough and we would be by the same token we'll be going out and reviewing other boroughs so it won't be us assessing ourselves it will be another borough coming in and giving us a hard time so we can look forward to that and the only thing the other any other thing i'd add sorry the other thing i'd add councillor guder is uh since we started this process as we've gone through the frameworks i think one of the things that struck me is that the things we're looking at are things we really do want to do as well. So it's not really about passing the test. It's actually, it is quite a strong alignment between what the framework is asking of us and the things we want to do to make our services better anyway. So hopefully it's pushing us in the right direction rather than just making us veer away from, from what we want to do to kind of just, just to look good. And Sorry, I didn't get what you said there, uh, so... You are saying that when, another borough will assess. Yes, we're having right. peer review. Same thing, because you're still going to, to give them well, your it's information. Not the borough that's marked. Yeah. So they have they have no interest in, in doing yeah. anything other than sort of being really honest with us. So it's not us marking ourselves. It's, um, no, I, no, I don't no, know who we're going to end. What we think we have done well, isn't it? No, they're going to come in and look. Yeah, they, 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 we will, we will, that assessment will be based on another borough's assessment of how oh, we are. They, they, yeah. they, so, we, so, so it might be, say, uh, you know, social care experts from Hackney, Hackney or, come in and yeah. look at us, or we might go and look at Hackney, basically. And, and so, oh, you know, yeah. it's not us marking us. And then at the end of the day, it's the CQC coming in, so it's not in our interests to give ourselves a kind of glowing report because the CQC will still be coming in at the end of the day. Check. And if we're not prepared, then, you, you know, we could end up in a, a mess. Um, and just quickly, um, Veronica, as you're on, on the, the call, are there any areas of social care that you think uh, our team should be particularly looking at just in terms of feedback you're gaining from residents at the moment? So in terms of social care, we're um, taking, a, it's not necessarily social care specific, we're taking a deeper dive look into the experience of um, the experience of people with autism and learning disabilities, um, young people with autism and learning disabilities, and specifically taking a deeper dive look into um, their experiences, particularly regarding health. 
um, and di early diagnosis. And I know that the intersection between that and social care is quite interesting. So I would think um, a focus on younger people also within this landscape and how they access their own social care plans. Would anyone like to come back on that or? Tony, do you want to come in on that one? Um, I wasn't when I was waving away before. It was wasn't so much about what Veronica was saying there, but Veronica, if you could share that with um, with us, we'd be obviously very pleased to to discuss that further with you in setting what that looks like. Um, but I just wanted to add to the conversation that was going on before, and I think it was kind of said as well. But but CQC are not necessarily looking for the best; they're looking for people to be genuine honest and people who can identify their own improvement needs and I think it will look a, a lot better on us that we're honest and can say we know we're not perfect this is where we need to improve rather than doing some sort of glossy brochure image and trying to you know trying to get the best score as it were but I do hear what you're saying Councillor Laguda because I do recall those days many years ago when we used to sit in those rooms in that Broadway house when we used to be regulated previously uh, yeah. yeah. So I'd like to bring this item to a close now. My thanks to Councillor Neil Wilson, Jason, Charlotte, Claire, Tony, and uh, all other office, officers present for attending this item. So we're now moving on to item eight, executive response update, health inequalities and learning from the Marmot reports review. Um, this item is to give the Commission an understanding of how the Council and its NHS partners were looking to address and, where possible, implement the recommendations of the Commission's Health Inequalities Report from last year. So I'm delighted that we're still joined by uh, Councillor Neil Wilson, Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care, Councillor Mumtaz Khan, Deputy Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care, Jason Strelitz, Interim Corporate Director of Adults and Health, Jonathan Cox, Public Health Consultant, Public Health. Uh, Marie Truman Abel, Interim Joint Newham Director of Delivery, NHS North East London. And Joe Fraser Wise, also Interim Joint Newham Director of Delivery, North East London. Um, are there any additional executive members, officers uh, present? If so, would you like to introduce yourselves? And I don't think there are. I think they've all fled. <laughs> fled. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. So I think the best way to start would be to invite Councillor Neil Wilson and Jason Strelitz to make some brief opening remarks. Yes, thanks very much, Chair. I'm conscious of time. So I just want to say that obviously both uh, my colleague Montes and myself being charged by the Mayor to certainly look at the whole area of health and equalities. There's some really good work which this Commission heard about, I think at its last meeting, about the whole issue of how we can not, not just set up a council-led um, tackling racism and equality just proportionality program, but how we embed, because of our very diverse needs in population terms of addressing what Marma has actually done. There's there's that work going on, because it's consistent with 50 steps, which is, a, again, something that will come back to this committee in terms of uh, the refresh that we're already looking forward to doing on that programme. And just finally to say that in terms of uh, our learning on the health inequalities report, I think it's important also to say, as I think is in the um, submission that you've already got in front of you, in the context of not just what we've heard from the GPs and uh, the 50 steps, but how we make certain that we've got a programme to tackle health inequalities, not just at the integrated care partnership strategy sort of documents, but how we actually, I know um, others in the room heard me saying this and we said it at Health and Wellbeing Board the other day. You know, Chair, a lot of these are really not... Let's use this opportunity to actually make certain we make not incremental, but real progress on it. Um, can I just quickly, before Jason, so you in, standing. extend standing orders? Right. Is, is everyone happy? Is everyone happy to second stick on that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Jason. Um, the only, you know, thank you. The only, um, you know, I really welcome the 
the committee's report um, on health inequalities, the Marmot work, personally has inspired me through my public health career. I started my public health career in 2008, working for Michael Marmot on, on the health inequalities review. I, I guess the two things that I want to emphasize, one is that we will shortly, and hopefully not by March, but probably by the next scrutiny committee, be able to bring the, um, the two year update on 50 steps to healthier borough and also the plans that we are making for the, the, the refresh, um, because obviously that's it's coming to the end of its first phase of, of life, the 50 steps. And secondly, to emphasize that we are, ever since we started this process, we've not had, we've been hit, trying to hit a moving target. Um, you know, it's, you know, we'd all love to be um, a world, kind of, the world to be a place where we can just have the challenges that we have and incrementally make them better over time. But the realities are over this period, we've had a pandemic and a cost of living crisis and two things which massively impact on the nature of inequalities that are experienced by the borough. So that's, I think it's really important that we, we think about that context. And, and part of the refresh will reflect some of the things that weren't necessarily hugely on our radar to quite the same way. So poverty was one of the priorities, goal priorities in the initial 50 sets, but I think it's clearly become more acute in the period since then. Um, refugee and asylum wasn't a state of priority in quite the same way in the 50 steps. That's clearly, again, become a challenge that's more acute since then. Um, we had now have, we did talk about children in temporary accommodation, but the temporary housing situation is getting acutely worse again. So our context and the context that shapes health inequalities in our borough is changing. Um, that's all I wanted to say by, by way of introduction. John, did you? So I know we've got John Cox as well. I don't know if John wanted to yeah, add anything. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Thanks, Jason. So yeah, as, I think as Jason highlighted, um, we'll be bringing the um, update around the uh, fifty steps. So like a two-year progress um, update. So obviously, this is our kind of really a key strategy. Um, how we address the um, our. Um, wider determinants, uh, challenges that really impact on, on inequality, um, you know, in, in so many ways. Um, so I think kind of, you know, as that's set out in the, um, in the committee uh, response. Um, and I think kind of, I just want to highlight a few, um, a few points um, and some of the key work that we've done since. Of course, we have, um, we brought the um, health impacts of COVID um, analysis and report uh, to the health and wellbeing board um, about a year ago now which led to the creation of the um, new equity board um, so that's kind of been a really positive um, step forward um, and I think that's really helping with our uh, bringing to our system a, a, a focus and a, a route forward um, around um, how to sort of tackle inequalities um, and given all the challenges that uh, see that Jason outlined that uh, outlined that have you know adversely impacted, so we have just to highlight a couple of points in that. So the, the equity board um, is been in setting out a, a roadmap which is helping our system to I suppose systematically identify and challenge um, inequality um, and creating a I suppose a, a sort of learning health system approach to this. So it's really helping us to kind of embed. Um, this approach across the system in, in everything we do um, and how we now view um, through the lens of um, accessibility, relevance and trust, which really our learning from COVID really helps us to understand how inequalities play out and impact um, amongst our, our residents. Um, and I'll just highlight a couple of the projects uh, that which um, have sort of specific focus under the equity board. So some diabetes prevention work where we're drilling down into the pathways and the prevention opportunities that people go through. Um, there's all the immigrant and asylum seeker work and support that we do um, the, within the NHS PCNs. So they have an in inequity focus around um, immunizations, particularly and cancer. So access to cancer, cancer diagnosis. Um, we have all the great um, work under the uh, maternity program 
um, around continuity care of care there um, and uh, young black men and their, um, their access, improving their access to uh, preventative and early mental health services. Um, so those are just sort of a few few examples of some of the really great pieces of work that are now running under the equity board. Um, the East London Foundation Trust have this fantastic QI approach to help us, helping us develop quality assurance, quality improvement. So that is now kind of being embedded in into the work. And we have our equity um, route map, which is again is about how we sort of introduce this approach to sort of systematizing um, uh, what we do. So I kind of I won't sort of say any more because I know it might leave some time for discussion around that. But it's just to give you a little flavour there um, of some of the things um in the space that we're we're working on now thanks Jeff. so in terms of the 50 steps i feel that there are two purposes in in one sense it's about making people aware of everything that is going on across the system in in newham so a kind of information approach and then on the other side it is actually using our sort of public health money and partnership working to actually sort of bring about improvements. So I've got two questions, one based on each side of that. Firstly, I'm just wondering how we ensure that all this wonderful information, and um, I've got a great collection of uh, 50 Steps newsletters that I was sharing with um, our officer yesterday, uh, how we ensure that that wonderful collection of information doesn't just go to the likes of uh, councillors, but does actually get out to the people who need it in an accessible form. So we have that newsletter goes out monthly, um, uh, typically with a thematic focus and then some other things that are going on. And we've got a really fantastic um, mailing list that's going right, um, right across our voluntary and community sector. Lots of residents who've signed up you know, typically kind of activist re interested residents who are who are signed up, people involved in community groups. So we have, and it's we've really, through all of the work through the pandemic, through the Social Welfare Alliance, New Food Alliance, we've built up those strong networks that are able to disseminate that information much more widely. Um, so I'm not, I don't know the exact number that are on the mailing list. I can find out, find that out for you, but I know it goes to, um, to many hundreds. Um, and is is it available in, in, in a sort of hard copy form? In I don't think we do it in hard copy form. Um, apart from, we've got, I have a few people who have specific requests for it in hard copy form. I don't think we routinely send it out in hard copy form currently. I'm just wondering whether it might be something that would be good to have in surgeries and yeah. libraries, maybe. Yeah, we uh, definitely so think about where people do definitely to. think about a kind of targeted mm. some targeted uh, printing of that. And then the, the, the second side of this is just in terms of the impact, uh, particularly the impact that our council public health spending is is having. How are we me measuring that? Because that's the one thing. I'm not sensing, um, and I know you were talking about having a two year update, but I've never had the sense that there's a dashboard there and we're actually sort of measuring the impact of particular parts. I, mean, I was talking to Councillor Wilson yesterday uh, and just picked up one example, you know, in terms of our, uh, you know, retail food offer, you know, can we say that that has improved since the 50 steps came through? Can we say that there's been a reduction in unhealthy food outlets? I felt there might have been a rather odd shift. Yeah. I'm not seeing as many chicken shops suddenly, but I am seeing more cake shops. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm just wondering where that part of the process is. So I never get any sense with the 50 steps that there is clear monitoring of impact. I mean, just, just can I yeah. run that example? Because you know, I'm a bit obsessed with about the number of shops in my own ward. But, you know... Uh, Public health has got, you know, officers who, who work specifically on the, the New and Food Alliance, and I think that's a good coordinating body. There are issues, of, as you as we had in that discussion yesterday, Chair, about, you know, uh, local planning guidance, and that's slightly better than it was. But it's about how do we make certain, and I think you, you've touched something, and I'll bring Jason in, about how we make certain for a one council approach. And this discussion I've had with the Mayor and Mumtaz in fact, about this health inequality stuff. How do we present impact? 
we, we can have key performance indicators that are measurable. Some of these are harder because they come up. You know, yeah, public health, yes, we're dealing with food and healthy food and weight management issues. How do we get that messaging across and the data collection, I think, is an issue for how we manage to review the process. But over to Jason in terms of... So, so the vast majority of the public health grant resource goes on particular commissioned interventions, all of which collect data on, um, you know, on impact, so whether it's substance misuse services, sexual health, health visiting and school nursing, um, significant chunk goes on the Eat for Free program. So the vast majority of it goes on on those kinds of programs, which do collect kind of pretty rich data in terms of um, in terms of impact. And and most of the new spending since the fifty cents was introduced has been in those kinds of services. So our new weight management services, our smoking cessation. Um, again, all services which are very data rich in terms of reach and impact of those services. Um, so, that, so I think there's a you know there's a very good story to tell on on that. On the specific thing you mentioned on food, I think it's a that's a really challenging area. So, um, that is one of the priorities um, in in the fifty steps. We know we have very few levers around um, the retail space. Um, particularly, uh, you, we, you know, you can, we have, a, we, 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 max, we maximize what planning law allows us to do, but it doesn't allow us to do anything about what's existing now. So we can't turn the clock, it doesn't allow us to turn the clock back. What has happened in the, in the food space, and I think reflects my earlier comments, is that whereas our food strategy was initially quite geared to um, trying to work out how we could shift that retail context, it has had to pivot quite significantly to food security. And that was a result of the challenges of the pandemic and into the cost of living crisis. So we're doing extraordinary things through the New York Food Alliance. And, and actually with the innovations that we've done, so by giving um, um, community organisations, industrial fridges and food safety advice, able to distribute surplus fresh fruit and veg, meat, fish, able to give people struggling on the lowest incomes access to a much healthier diet, than if they were accessing through traditional food banks, we're actually able to, to meet food, food security through a dietary, positive dietary lens. But that has been a significant pivot that wasn't necessarily when, what we first anticipated. When I asked colleagues um, in the early, earliest, earliest days of the pandemic, four lockdowns, but we saw what was starting to happen to investigate, um, tell us how many food banks there were. So they found that as their view, and you may have a different view as councillors, that we we knew we're in touch with seven food banks in the borough in the early stages of food bank. We've currently got 40 organisations who are part of the New York Food Alliance. So it's a massive shift in terms of what our, the food focus of our public health work is. What we want to do now is, you know, and we, we've done a lot as well through primary schools, through Eat for Free, through the grant conditions to try and shift that to a healthier offer. We've got an event in a few weeks' time, which is starting to, which is called reimagining secondary school food. So, trying to think about the different frontiers of food where we can use our public health influence and the levers that we have. But where are the KPIs kind of overall? Where where is because I, I know there was a lot of talk about a dashboard, and I'll, I'll just finish off where I was going. My first question, and then I, I, I really want to bring in Councillor Birdie, um, but. Are we at some stage going to see an actual dashboard to see how all 52 of our steps are performing? So, so in the John, do you want to come in on that? Because you will, yes. Uh, yes. Um, so we have, um, yeah. So in the what we've done in the two year report, well, in it just just finishing the work now is pulling together the um, understanding of the measures uh, just to um, to describe. Well, some of the sort of summary indicators that describe a lot of the the processes and activities that go on across that that breadth of work. Um, so it's very much about kind of understanding the the um, the, the delivery of um, of those those steps and the actions that we're taking. Um, what we haven't done is to kind of create a I suppose a kind of more sort of wider population health. Um, dashboard which perhaps you're, you're um, thinking about that there is some published data already that sort of describes that which is very helpful that we can look to um but yeah we haven't we haven't sort of 
probably pulled that together yet. So that might be something that we um, we do uh, we do think about, so we can help to describe the um, you know the health status uh, of our residents and the inequities. Um, but yeah, we have very much focused on on the um, the activities that we deliver under the steps, and then the um, the, the, if the rationale and understanding the logic and the impacts of that that will have on the population health outcomes that we're we're trying to address um but as jason J jason obviously indicated earlier is you know it, it's been a series of you know real challenges uh, of the system our residents uh, and of course there are you know various issues about you know we know very high population mobility so it's you know of course it's a, a really complex picture of measuring um measuring the improvements that um that we, we would arise from all of the work we do across the strategy so yeah this is a challenging area but it's, it's one that we're definitely very happy to uh, to give further thought to though so just to be clear the indicator set that will be in the two-year report like the one-year report is are we delivering the 50 steps that we set out to deliver yeah. or how effectively are we delivering our 50 steps what's much harder because of the moving targets that i said at the beginning is linking that to population health outcomes yeah. but how do we know that we've, we've been a it, it's been successful because well we what we're doing is implementing evidence-based interventions that all of the evidence says these are the right things to be doing it's very very difficult in a short time when the world is changing so much to be able to say because we've done this the effects on our population prevalence on indicator why it's this that's that's that drawing that correlation either for good or for bad is very very is, is is very difficult to do in a meaningful way what's much 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 more meaningful is to say these are the evidence-based interventions these ones we've implemented successfully these ones we've implemented less successfully we know we've got very good reason to believe that if every school going back to one of the recommendations in your report we've got good evidence to suggest uh, very good evidence to show that if we um, deliver, get every primary school in Newham doing the daily mile, yeah. it will have a positive impact on health outcomes. So that's our goal, to get as many of those schools doing the daily mile as possible. Will that necessarily show a reduction in child obesity? Not necessarily, because there's other factors going on as well. A cost of living crisis, which is affecting family diets and what children are eating at home, irrespective of the daily mile. But that doesn't stop the daily mile being the right intervention that we should be pursuing for children in schools. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Councillor Verdi, sorry to make you wait. That's quite okay, Susan. Uh, I'll have a number of questions really about the 50 steps and I'll start off with the, the type of food that's actually delivered to the people in a sense that I've seen on a number of occasions the type of food or the standard of the food that's delivered to them is put straight in the bin and the food that's actually sent from a food bank or from an organization making the food is a fit for purpose to the to the delivery address it's going to because you what i've seen is you might get um i'm trying to think of a of a, of a, a meal now but the asian person is not going to eat that food because it's English food. So here we are, we might be preparing the food to be sent there, but it's not the right food for the person. So the person just puts it in the fridge, and then at the end of the day, it's dubbed down the chute. That's one thing. Like, how, we we actually, how we actually how want... Needs, we, it's a shame Andy Gold's not here to answer that specific question, but I think the point you're making is about lack of culturally appropriate food within the new environment. Susan, it is, uh, but I think, I think if Jason I just wants... carry on... Um, the thing about actually the the bullets points we're sending to residents about what they should be doing about key points if there are organizations like myself say I'll get a, a, a me email from an officer coming this is what we sh should be highlighting in the community how are we making sure that that the person like me is actually who's getting the email is able to feed that information into a community place so it's not actually on display because that place might not have a place uh, a display system to put on there to reach out to the community so rather than just me it's going out to maybe 50 or 60 people that visit the place or the organization 
And do we know a cost, sir, for how much is it actually costing us at the moment? Or is it all voluntary or food that comes from large organisations that's actually supplying it for free? Thank you. So, firstly, it would be really, really helpful for Andy to get any specific feedback where you see that happening. That's that's the Andy goal. That's the first thing to say. I think the key thing about the New Food Alliance, though, is that we, the role that we as a local authority take, we are um, we are the distributors of surplus food within the system to local community organisations who are really in touch with their communities. I hope. That's 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 a theory, and 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 we know that those community organisations do give the New and Food Alliance a lot of feedback on things that they want, um, things that they don't want anymore, and 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 they're shaping it off. Now, where that's not working, it'd be really helpful to get their intelligence. But I think our, our um, that we think it that works in lots of ways. Now, I know I'm not Andy Gold is the expert on this. I know there are things that um, organisations want that we don't often get a lot of through the New Food Alliance. So, for example, there's not a lot of, for example, surplus rice um, in the system. Rice doesn't, because, you know, the rice, the industry doesn't have a lot of surplus rice, so we don't get past a lot of that, which would be welcomed by lots of lots of our residents. But um, that is that is a drawback in the system. But what we're doing is redistributing a huge amount of excess surplus food. But I, I, I kind of reiterate the point that, we, you know, it is... We don't we don't do anything anymore since much earlier days in the pandemic of delivering food straight to families, apart from in very exceptional circumstances. It's almost exclusively done through community organizations yeah. um, who, 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 who know their who know their community. In terms of the information, that sounds really sensible and we're really up for 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 ideas about how we spread that information more effectively. Um, and the third question was about money. So our, the money that we spend is on the hub, is on the front door. So the referrals that we get, so, so to manning that front door, so that um, because there are, we get a lot of referrals, which we then pass on to community organizations and the distribution hub. That's the other place that we spend money. Um, we get, what we're doing is for a very, very small investment, getting extraordinary value into Newham in terms of uh, surplus food. Um, but we can provide, very happy to provide details on the kind of finances behind New Newham Food Alliance as well. Do you want to come back on that, Councillor Verde? Oh yeah, thank you, Jason. Sorry, but using my phone to make the call. Um, Yes, it'd be good for that to come back. And can I just ask one additional supplementary? When we talk about 50 steps and uh, having pre-diabetic clinics, et cetera, right? How are those actually monitored in a sense? Because in one sense, I had to visit one just last week or two weeks ago. I was the only person there that turned up. You want to answer that one, Wax? Sorry. I'll let you start. Well, so so the whole with the so we don't the fifty steps is a system approach. So I haven't I don't have monitoring information on everything that's going. What we're trying to do, I think, it goes back to what your first question was, um, or part of your first kind of categorization of what the fifty steps is. There's some sets of specific actions, but this is about a system intervention. This is trying to get. Um, all parts of Newham Borough, not just Newham Council, working on health inequalities. So um, I, I don't, I don't have direct data that pre-diabetic clinics would be monitored within the NHS and within NHS monitoring. Um, so that, that's, um, yeah. Councillor Laguda, do you want, do you want to come in? On the trade, which is the tackling racism and inequality. You've got something called anonymized recruitment. I'd like to know how you can do an anonymized recruitment when you ask people to, to say who they are. What's anonymized recruitment? So, so this is very much not specific to health inequalities, but the broader, broader council. But just to answer, it's about, 
It's about having application forms that don't have people's names on, yeah. because I think there's an evidence, good evidence base that um, uh, because of racism and discrimination, people will screen candidates based on their name. And if you and if you look at don't buy that one, um, uh, and and the belief that if if you take names off applications, people are more likely to get a fair um, a fair approach in the long in the shortlisting process. That's the that's a principle. It's not. It's really an HR. Yeah. It's an HR intervention rather than a specific health inequalities. Okay. I mean, if anything, I'd say that that probably doesn't go far enough because there are other things that. I know my organisation has done and I've seen great practice elsewhere in the country where they look at what a candidate has done rather than their qualifications. Yes. And I know when I went for my current job, university I'd been to, the degree I'd got, all of that was taken out. You, you know, they were looking at what I'd actually done um, and that was how I, I was judged in terms of coming into that that interview and I think it's a very progressive way of, of doing things and ensuring that people get the the jobs they're, they're gonna the best people get the jobs rather than people who've been to a certain university or yeah yeah but maybe some jobs will sort of pass by your CV first before they even uh, send you and you know so if somebody asks you for your CV, they will know who you are anyway. Yeah. But what 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 they will do is they will take that level of the the HR person would take that level of detail off. So in terms of people who shortlist, in terms of the panel, who it, it, or in terms of the shortlisting process, they would not have the name. They would just have the details of the candidates, and I know I've taken part in recruitments. Uh, Councillor Wilson, did you want to come in? Or well, yeah, just just to say that this, remember that this is about a, a whole council approach on tackling racism, inequality and disproportionality. Senior appointments panel have been doing the council in the good for a while. It's about where, and, you know, other health partners, I, I've been on recruitment for East London Foundation, I think the care has. You know, it's standard now that you, you get... Uh, that taken off because there is evidence that people would be determined based on names or, as you say, other criteria. But can I just bring in? Sorry, are we nearly out of time. Um, I just checked with Roger, and um, I mean, I'm not saying we we need to keep scrutinising till the bitter end, but um, we are it. able to uh, keep going till nine thirty. Did you, sorry, did you want to? No, 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 I'd rather hear from commission members about us. Councillor. I think you, wanted to come in. I wanted to go. My son is our set donkey. That, that's absolutely fine, but thank you so much for coming. <laughs> do, you, do you have any questions before you leave us? So the recruitment is saying it's pre-diabetic check. Is it for pre-diabetic check? Um, Councillor Birdie asked a question about a pre-diabetic check that uh, he was saying, if I'm correct, that uh, had, hadn't had an attendance? Mm. No, before, few years before, it's long years before they had done them in the market, in the street, as the NHS health check, you know, to, to find out diabetes. Fine. I mean, we, we, we were looking at it in the context of um, the, the 50 steps yeah. public health plan that we're doing yeah. now. Has anyone else got any other questions? I'm just going to mention something. When you talk about competency, taking the names out of the people before they employ them, it, it involves a lot of things. But my question is, I know it might not be this, I'm going to digress a bit. The question is that, how many local people in Newham are in Newham Council or part of the directorate? Sorry, Sorry. So, are you saying how many of our, our employees are? No. Yeah, well, that, that's an HR question. We haven't got that information. It's health health scrutiny. But when I was when I was the cabinet, well, well, executive member for equalities and social inclusion, we did used to get data, and I'm sure that will be provided on the ranks of uh, officers and their ethnic and um, that information we've collected, ethnic group. Uh, gender balance. Uh, there's a report, and I forget where it resides. Jason, do you know it? No, but there is. Well, yeah, yeah, there is. There is a report, but it we can't necessarily answer that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's about how many are local, how many are you know. Mary. And again, just quickly, I mean, I'm quite interested with the equity board whether there are any targets 
in terms of what we're, we're, we're trying to achieve over time in terms of um, presentation. The equity board, the, the targets will be located within the services that are going through that transformation. So the equity, that particular strand of work is all about different different areas of health or care practice yeah. trying to improve equity outcomes in their area. You know, we've got hundreds of different kind of service services and also, you know, there's work going on by maternity, by mental health services, uh, in parts of social care. So each one, the, the kind of the roadmap that's been discussed to how you achieve equity within your service, each it's, it's for each service to achieve equity within its its own outcomes. I mean that that that's fine, but I think one of the things we we've noted is we've we've gone through this grand sweep through our system, sort of looking at inequalities is is a lack of targets, and it would be really interesting. Um, and I realise you know we would have to go through bit by bit, just but just to get some idea of where we're aiming and what we're hoping to sort of achieve. So again, I, I kind of I'd go back to saying that I think the I think the most legitimate targets are are we delivering the change that we that we're looking to deliver rather than are we seeing the different population health outcomes because those are influenced by so many factors. Okay, if there are no further questions, I think I'd like to bring this item to a close. Um, and thank everybody who's attended, and in particular, Councillor Neil Wilson, Jason Strelitz, officers, and our NHS colleagues. Um, item uh, 10 was to have been the Health Inequalities and Maternity Services Report, but with the committee's permission, I'd like to defer that to the next meeting, as uh, there's one recommendation in particular where we're going to have to give a lot of attention to the wording owing to um, input we've had from a number of partners and kind of resolving uh, that. So that will be back in March. Uh, the next meeting will be on March 14th. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Um, and uh, with that, I'm now closing the meeting time of 9.15. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's 17, apparently. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's cool. Oh, yeah. yeah.